Welcome back, Reg audience. Uh, we hope there's been, for any of you who are tuning in from outside the UK today, there's been terrible storms. There's been leaves blowing all over the road. There's been things like that happening. There's been sort of, there's, there's been the rustling of branches. Of course, that means that all public transport is cancelled. Everyone in the world is working from home today, and the whole of the UK has shut down. So I imagine that some of you might be tuning in today from home because the telly is not very good at this time in the morning. And so you think, let's do something that looks like work. Well, we're going to work you very hard today. We've got some important stuff and we've got some really good information, very useful. And um, a couple of guys who are experts in the field of backup, something that you, as we know from our reg surveys, often neglect. Well, it's understandable, it's hard, and no one really gets prizes for doing it properly. Well, this is a problem for you, and we're going to solve it. And uh, So, this is what we're about today. We're about backing up your VMware environment. The question, is it under control? Well, no, it's not, is it? Uh, so, who's going to get it back under control again? On our RegCast today... On the, the far end of the table from Dell Software, Adrian, welcome to the studio. Good morning, Tim. Uh, you had a bit of a struggle getting in today, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, it was you? a fun little journey. Um, all of 50 miles, but it seemed to take a couple of hours this morning. <laughs> we're, glad, <laughs> we're glad you made it. Thank you very much. All right, what do you do at Dell Software? Uh, I'm a director for systems consulting for data protection uh, across EMEA. So I look after the pre-sales side of things for data protection. Good. And uh, uh, also joining us uh, from Dell Software, we have two for the program, two experts today from Dell Software, uh, all the way from Amsterdam this morning, Yap. Good morning, Tim. Welcome to the studio. It was quite easy, actually easier to you come from another for country. For me, it was the easiest travel I've ever done. Um, <laughs> the flights are on time. Uh, public transport always works in the UK, as I found out, and I was on time, so... Uh, so yeah, it's the further you come, the easier it is, I suppose, isn't it? Now, what do, what do you do at Dell Software? Um, I'm the technologist for data protection. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been working in the data protection field for what feels for all my life, but apparently about 20 years. Um, yeah. What's your job title in Dutch? Senior technologist. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, I was like, because you, know, you could have said almost anything there. I could have, we would I'm, I'm sure there's have known. in the audience. Yeah. So <laughs> <careful>. Probably <laughs> so. And, uh, and also, joining us, we've got three first timers in the studio today. Joining us for his first time in from Freeform Dynamics, Charles New Blood Brett. Charles, welcome to the studio. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's, what do you think? Do you think it's nice here? It's, yeah, you know, it's very good. been all right to you so far? Apart from coming from South London. Well, you yeah, know, South London. I've never getting... had to queue outside the tube station before. <laughs> why, would you, why would you queue to get on a tube? <laughs> and, um, so, guys, we, uh, again, the most important thing about this interface, look above our heads and there will be some buttons for you. The most important button is the asking questions one. Because if you ask questions, they come up on my screen here. I ask the guys and they answer you. And uh, it's no point in complaining that we didn't talk about the thing you wanted to talk about when you had the chance to ask a question. Remember also that you can download the slides, you can follow the links that we're going to give you, and you can tell us what you thought of it afterwards. Do you want any more of this? more of this subject. We don't cover it very often. If you do tell us you want some more, we will do some more, because that's how we do things at the Reg. So uh, let's get on with it, first of all. Now, first of all, we have, let's look at the problem. And it's a serious problem, uh, isn't it, Adrian? It, it is. I mean, virtualization is a great technology. It's enabled us to do an awful lot of things in our data centers. And it's one of those technologies that's kind of been interesting in the growth of its use. We have this issue we call VM sprawl, where it's so easy to create virtual machines these days. Very simple to do, and we keep doing it. Uh, I've not come across a virtualization infrastructure that gets smaller. I don't know if our, <laughs> any of our viewers have seen that yet, but they just don't get smaller, they only get bigger. And they get more complex, and we have the data growth issue as well, which is compounding all of that, the content inside the virtual machines too. So it's a real problem. And we see 57% like of new server workloads are being virtualized now. So we're not doing this on the physical stuff anymore. It's all being virtualized because it's simple and easy to do. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming a real problem for us to manage, specifically when we start talking about backup, we've got more to move, more data to protect, and in an ever-increasing in complexity as well. So I, I mean, what we're seeing, Yap, is you know, from those boxes all down the side, though, whilst we're making a lot of virtual machines, we're not keeping pace with it, with the way that we're protecting them and backing them up. 
and you know, no, the, we've got we've not putting the infrastructure in place that we need. No, that's right. As Adrian said, it's, a, it's so easy to create a machine. You've got a machine in 10 minutes, and the only reason you create virtual machines is you, in the end you're going to put some data on there, data that could be critical to your end users. And you better make sure that you actually protect that data. But there, there will be one point in time where that machine will fail, either through a user error, either through a, a hardware failure, but in one point it will fail. And then you better hope that you can recover the data that's sitting on those machines. It's not quite right to say, well, we could just make another one. It only takes 10 minutes. <laughs> well, no, I, let, let, let me add to that. Yeah. I, mean, I worked at an organization where they actually had more virtual machines than they had people. Hmm. And most of them I didn't know about. And I put some software in to actually look at how many virtual machines, well, I, I put it in for other purposes. And hmm. I discovered there were more virtual machines than there were people. And nobody knew. And I went and told the IT director. And he said, oh, really? I hadn't got a clue. So if you don't, exa if you, you don't know, back it up. yeah, if you, don't, you can't back it up, you don't know it exists in the first place. Right. I mean, the fundamental thing is that there is this exactly. sprawl is happening in an unchecked way, and the valuable information is then Correct. just sitting there, and we don't know what we're doing with it. Now you've got some. You've looked at the Reg audience, haven't you, Charles? Yes, yeah, so we've got these slides here. I've got three slides here, and I just quickly go through them. And the important thing to take from this is. Uh, on this particular one is Regcast users tell us, in all their honesty, uh, what they're doing. And look, over half of the organizations just aren't doing very much. Mm. Do you have uh, something explicitly called a disaster recovery plan, which must include backup? An awful lot of them don't. And only a few, 23%, do have a good plan, mm -hmm. which is it's very striking. If you go on to the next chart. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is people summing up, summing up their own uh, disaster recovery capabilities. Again, over 50% of uh -huh. organizations really aren't properly equipped. And again, this will include all the VMware stuff, almost certainly. 22% totally lacking. That's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> this is what you see, guys, when you go in. Adrian, do you, when you go in and see people, do you see people with stuff that's does disaster recovery <laughs> capability that's totally lacking? Um, unfortunately, yes. You do come across it quite often. Um, and a lot of people say, yes, well, we're doing a backup. That, that's a DR plan. Well, kind of it's the start of a DR plan. But a lot of people don't actually bother to check. I asked that a question of a lot of audiences, and you ask them how often they check their, their backups so they can actually recover data. Mm -hmm. You don't see any hands coming up very often. So that's also part of a DR plan. But having totally lacking anything, unfortunately, we still do people just say, why do I need to do that? Everything's working fine. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, you still do see it. Yeah. Actually, it, yeah, it, it has broken in a little while. Pretty much. So we, so we stopped thinking about yeah. it. And the, the other thing is, people tend to focus just on the technology side of business. Uh, yes, we got our backup software, and we run our backup uh, every day, and then we take the tape or whatever, and we put it on top of the machine we're protecting. So if something happens to that uh, to that environment, you've got a fire, you lose the machine, and you lose your backup. So it's not just about the technology; it's putting the procedures in place of making mm -hmm. sure you get data offsite as well and. Mm -hmm. and data is usable. Mm -hmm. We've been nagging people about this for a long time, Charles. Forever. Well, so do you think everyone stopped listening? Do you think everyone now is saying, yeah, yeah all right, yeah, it's stopped with the name? No, I think just uh, things change. I mean, in the uh, VM-type environment, mm -hmm. it gets even more complicated because you, know, you, you haven't got sort of one machine and a lot of disks that are related. You've got lots of virtual machines and lots of virtual storage, and you can't actually see what it is. Yeah. Yes. Let's have a look. You've got the, your third slide yeah, here. Yeah, the third slide is, uh, again, to sort of uh, deliver feedback from Regcast uh, users and visitors, is the green, which really, I guess, should be red, bright I red. I was about to say, we've both, you know, we're giving the wrong signal by saying, <laughs> look, there's a lot of green there. The green and the grey yeah. is the people who are not doing things. The brown and the yellow are the ones of people who are doing things. And it's across, you know, companies with over 5,000 employees, 250 to 5,000, and, you know, all sizes. The mm. bigger ones tend to be better because there are bigger risks and so on. But it isn't good. No. So we're just looking at management in a joined-up way so that the people aren't just... A, and actually, the, the, the small guys and the big guys, they, they've still got the same problems here, haven't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. They're all as bad as each other. Well, the big, the big guys have the advantage. They have the size and the scale to be able to have people to devote to it. Mm -hmm. The smaller you are, the smaller the business you are, uh, it's not going to be a formal responsibility very often, or mm. it, it's a, an add-on. Yes. And that's part of the problem. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, somebody else has got other duties which uh, seem equally important. They may not be, mm -hmm. but it sort of just gets forgotten about or just done routinely. And as I think we'll probably discover later, uh, routine and forgetting to do things is one of the big problems. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, how much time should people spend thinking about this? Because there are, I would imagine some of the problem is that people will say to you, well, I, I've got quite a lot on my plate already. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, I, you're nagging. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll keep nagging people to do it. Um, but yes, what we do find is that the old adage of having to do more with less is very, very specific in the IT industry these days. And the backup side of life isn't isn't overly sexy. They want to go and do the front end things, give a good experience to end users, get the data out there for them. But of course, the neglect of protecting the data, it's still important you've got to do this. It's one of the most important things for a business. If they want to survive a disaster, they have to have adequate data protection. Mm -hmm. I, I think you know, if anyone's going to make this sexy, it's going to be you guys today. <laughs> this is your challenge. Yeah. And the other thing is, so people start looking at this once they actually had a disaster. And it's one of those things, like an insurance policy, you never look at the, uh, the small print until you actually have a disaster, until you actually need it. And that's where you find out the importance of, of having this and, and making sure that this is running fine. Mm -hmm. Well, the good thing is, you know, you're going to go over some pretty practical stuff about how you actually, how you make the decisions sure. on, on this sort of thing. And uh, so, uh, you know, first of all, we're going to have a look <laughs> at the sort of problem. Is, uh, you see, it's, normally I tell people you can't have these slides if they're too complicated because people can't read them. But that's the point about this one, isn't it? It is. Um, I didn't bring my reading glasses, so even yeah, for me, we, it's difficult to We're not going to go through this. I, point I, by I, point I was planning point. to. We, we had another 45 minutes, right? So I can go through this. <laughs> Let's um, not. But like I said, I, I've, I've been in IT for quite a long time, and this basically to show that we're way past the, uh, the situation where an environment existed of just five servers being an exchange server, file server, and, and maybe SharePoint. Um, <laughs> environments get more and more complicated. There's all kinds of different, different applications. In the virtual environment, we basically tend to create a virtual machine for every different application. Mm -hmm. uh, where we think it makes life easier. Uh, then we've got consolidation projects, we've got migration projects. Um, just for fun, we throw in some remote offices with no IT capabilities that need to be protected. And before you know it, you end up with a chart like this. And actually, if you print as you want to read it, you need a, a, an A0, and we can fill the, the, the back wall of this uh, quite let's, easily. Let's not go into reading, <laughs> shall we? But I, I, I mean, that gets. But this. You know, speaks to a sort of you know, a culture of it's really very hard. Where do I start? You don't just you know sort of plug a tape drive in or anything like that and just let you know let things go on without mm. thinking about it. You really do need to give this some proper thought. You, you do, and when you when you look at a, a slide, this is a really good example of something that's probably gone through organic growth in an IT environment. They've started off being fairly regimented and organised, and then time gets away with them, and it grows and it grows and it grows, and it suddenly becomes disparate and and mm. dysfunctional. And at that point, then you, you do have to step back and take some time and look at the whole thing holistically and say, how am I going to do this properly? Because right now it's so complex, you can't do it as a point solution anymore. You, you have to look at the whole picture. I see. Interesting. It's an early question just coming in for so you, Lawrence. You say, you know, he's got more than 15 million small files and, you know, it's two terabytes to, to you know, and you say, you know, how, do I, how do I deal with this? <laughs> It's, that would take, you know, it's going to take quite a lot of time. To, we can't really deal with the individual inquiries, can we? But what you're going to talk about is a method of thinking about it. Yeah, methods of thinking about it. And that's a very good example of using an alternate technology on what you're actually running the data on as opposed to looking at a backup technology to solve the problem. So mm -hmm. it might be that he needs to think of a different construct to store the data mm -hmm. rather than actually looking for something to back it up in that way. I would agree with that. Yeah. 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 A, a, a couple of really basic organisational ones. John T. saying... Whose responsibility is this? Whose job is this? So first of all, who do you end up talking to? And secondly, is that the right person? It's, it's kind of quite interesting, as, as you pointed out earlier. If they've had a disaster already, you're usually talking to the CIO or the CEO. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's, it's kind of high profile yeah. at that point. But otherwise, we're talking to um, IT administrators, IT managers, people that are running the daily operations of that IT infrastructure. Yeah. So it's usually CIO and down is the people we end up talking to. I mean, the question is, no one really wants to take this on, do they? Well, no, because yeah. it's seen as a business-critical operation, you see. It's yeah. one of those things that you might be looking over your shoulder all the time just to make sure you're doing it right. Okay. Well, so. No one says thank you when it goes right because they don't notice yeah. it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another thing. So um, you could look at from uh, talking to the backup uh, administrators, the storage administrators, but you also need to talk to the businesses because uh, different data has different value where an IT administrator can say, okay, I'm going to back up this server and make sure everything is protected. Uh, he might be forgetting about that very critical system uh, where the data is much more valuable and, and they just left it out. So you need to talk to the business as well to find out the value of the data that you're protecting. Oh, it's starting to look like a project already, Charles. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I, another interesting thing is how many CEOs do you know who would take responsibility for this? Uh, I, but yeah. they do take responsibility I, for the bank account. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, uh, it's true. And it, which is also, yes, as John was saying, he's, as he says, as he says, he's a service provider and he's saying he finds his biggest problem is to get people to pay for, to do this, to actually put budget aside to do this. Where does the budget come from? Where do they squeeze it out of? It's got to be out of IT. I've never heard of it coming from anywhere else, but no, no. it's also it's, true that there's great reluctance. Yeah, it, and that's, that is the usual place. You're right, it does come out of the IT, but in a larger organisations where they're doing discrete projects, a lot of the organisations will say, this is the cost of your project, and you need to ensure you have additional cost in there to protect the data of your project. So it should really, you know, on a project basis, it should get wrapped into the cost of the product. And but the it also then becomes complicated when you're into mm. a virtual environment because Very much you so. may hand over a VM to the line of business unit. Yeah. And the line of business logically then should be responsible for looking after itself. Mm -hmm. it? And at least on a, on a financial yeah. basis, but perhaps, yeah. Um, and then they hand over the operations back to the IT team. But those, that business area has paid for the protection. So how much of the... OK, so here's... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you've got your 100% there of the, of the money you're spending. How much should you be spending on disaster recovery? What slice of that? Well, that's, that, I mean, that's the... Uh, let's see if I got my piece of string in my pocket for you. you, can't you know, do that, just, uh, <laughs> there's no how long is a piece of string answer. Um, no, it depends answers on a range. It, it, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, it's a hard to pin down on a percentage because everybody's environment's different. Yes. No. So everybody's needs and requirements are different. Mm -hmm. So you always have different availability of data requirements, as John was saying, mm -hmm. as Charles was, was talking about classifying data. So yes. Potentially, you might spend more on the high-value data sets in the business. Good, yeah, and good. And you'd spend good. less on the lower-value data. Yes, yes, but yes. as a percentage... You're not going there. To, I'm not going to go there for you because it's a hard one to quantify. How important is the data to your business? You might say, well, it's, it's ultimately important if you've got a business-critical application that's the front of your business taking credit card transactions. You say, okay, well, I'm going to spend 60% of my revenue looking after that data set because it is the most important thing for my business. We're going to return to this yeah. later We're going on. to return to this later on in our hour. I'm tempted to say it's never enough because it's one of the last things that they add to a project. You say, okay, we're going to do this big project. It's going to have migration. It's going to have virtualization. Oh, and by the way, we need to do some backup. So let's see if we've got 1% of budget left. Um, and that's nowhere near enough. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get on to where this budget's actually going to go and how you actually spend your budget, how you structure your project, and how you do this thing properly. Yeah. This is a very useful slide for me because I didn't really understand at the beginning what you guys were talking about. And I looked at this, and this helped me. RPO, RTO objectives, some people will know what that means, some people won't. For both people, explaining. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so RPO. So these are the two acronyms that we live with in our, in our business. Mm -hmm. um, RPO is recovery point objective. So that's essentially the last time you did a backup. That's the point in time you're going to recover to. Mm -hmm. So that's what RPO is. It's fairly plain and simple. RTO is the recovery time objective. Now, there are varying views that people think what their recovery time objective actually is. A lot of them will think, oh, that's the guy in the van that's brought me my tape back. I've got my tape. That's taken two hours. That's my recovery time objective. Mm -hmm. What they should be viewing this is, as the recovery time objective is the time it takes your users to be up and running, using the data, and being productive again. So back to the point, as if it never happened. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Back to using the data that had, had disappeared, corrupted, or, or whatever the issue is that's forced you to recover the data set. So to be completely explicit, between that idea that OK, let's start recovering now, and the point at which you can you know, all try and forget what, 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 a, horrible, wrong. what a horrible time you have. <laughs> it's that time. Yeah. So yeah. based on the question we had earlier about the, uh, the 50 million files, it's actually when we've recovered that 50 million file. That is actually our RTO. It's not when we recover the first file. Because Murphy's Law is going to dictate that the file you actually need the most is going to be the last one. It's going to be the very last one yeah. that shows up. And also, you know, you, you know, your environment might not come back up in any sensible way until you've got it. Until you've got it all there. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I, and so that could be measured in hours. Hours, days, I've known weeks. Oh, dear. Yeah. 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 But we like to measure it in... We minutes. Like to measure minutes and hours are good. Yeah. We, we definitely <laughs> do. So, th we, so, we, so we have these two. So we have these two things. So we putting these two together. There's a tension between these two, isn't there? I guess well, there, there is some contention between what you would want to deliver and how you deliver it and the technology you put into it. 
So you start getting into the technology requirements. So being humans, we like to have a problem and we like to go and solve it. So we look to technology to solve the problems we've created for ourselves. Um, and you get into other technologies that start providing good recovery point objectives and good recovery time objectives. And we hit into this technology called near continuous data protection. This is the near CDP thing, uh -huh. which allows us to CDP, do... CDP, continuous yeah. data protection. You've got some good three-letter acronym. Well, we love our acronyms, right? We, you know, we live, we live on those things. So we can sit here and explain them to people. <laughs> <Yes>. so, <laughs> it's self-justification in a way, too, really. For. The, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so near CDP. Yes. How near? Um, we can go down to every five minutes. Mm -hmm. So usually that's enough for a lot of businesses and a lot of data sets. Every five minutes is sufficient. You can go less than that with other technologies available. Um, and we're going to discuss the impact of those a little later as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, every five minutes is usually enough. So that gives you a recovery point objective, that RPO, mm -hmm. of every five minutes. So you know, what you have in between there is the amount of data you're likely to lose or at risk of losing mm -hmm. is only five minutes worth of change. And, and, and as you point out here, I, I, is that because many of these VMs are going to sit around, they've got mostly static data on, quite a lot of them, mm -hmm. then you don't have to be a set obsessive about recovering them back to how they were a few seconds ago. Uh, absolutely, and, it, and the amount of change will dictate that as well. Yeah. Inside there, yeah. So, you know, for St. Charles's old employee, you know, those, of those thousands that they had kicking around, a lot of them had valuable data on, but I suppose that data wasn't really changing very much. I think they were even backing them up, so it wasn't an issue. <laughs> it wasn't an issue. <laughs> <laughs> they'll never know. <laughs> One day they'll go, they'll never come back. No one will ever look for it until something really important happens. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is the, the near real-time CDP is what everyone's looking for, but not everyone can have because of the constraints and, and, that we yeah, have. Yeah, and sometimes it's not relevant to the data set. So we've seen, you know, if it's a lot of static data, then perhaps you don't need to employ that kind of technology. Perhaps there's something else that actually might be more relevant. Uh-huh. Let's, let's, let's go on and let's have a look at these things. So this diagram, I like this. Let's spend a little bit of time on this. This is how you, uh, uh, this is how you balance what you do, how much you pay and how much risk yes. you pay. So this is the bit that we were kind of alluding to a little bit earlier. Yes. Um, you start looking at what's relevant for your business in the way of, of protection and what you're looking to do and how important the data is. Mm -hmm. um, we can have technologies that will give us extremely good RPO and RTO in the seconds and milliseconds. And, uh, you know. But it comes lot. at a cost, exactly. So if you look at the grey lines on the graph that we've got here in front of us, those grey lines going up the top, the better your RPO, mm -hmm. the more expensive it's going to cost you. So, yeah. Yeah. But you're mitigating against risk. This is all about mitigating against risk. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have less risk of losing data because you've got that good RTO and RPO. Mm -hmm. If we then look at the orange lines that are kind of going the opposite direction, mm -hmm. um, this is what happens when you have an RPO and an RTO that extend out beyond what you think might be reasonable. They cost less, but... Right. Initially, they cost less, but the longer you leave that RPO and RTO, the cost isn't actually about the technology, it's about the cost to the business. Ah, it's the sort of opportunity cost. Yeah, so now yes. you're looking at putting the business at risk because your RPO and RTO is, is too wide, it's too far away. Right. So you start losing revenue. We, we had a, um, a set of information uh, from some people who were talking about 53% of the organisations we've spoken to. Um, would cite a loss of revenue with a downtime of less than an hour. Mm -hmm. So if you start extending that out, you start having revenue impact. So that's why that orange curve goes up as well as cost. Because uh -huh. in the very real messy world, then, you know, you're, you're talking about hours just because organisations Just because, exactly, start yeah. To get yeah. These things started, yeah. So what you have to do is find a balance point between risk and cost. How much are you willing to risk data loss? How much data are you, you know, going to portion and say, well, OK, I can do without X amount of this particular data set because I can apply an applicable cost to that. So finding the balance, and that's usually where these two lines cross over. So we kind of circled on that chart there. Well, there's about a hundred questions in my head from this <laughs> because it's a you know it's one of those great things that you can draw on mm -hmm. a you know you can draw on a napkin or something yeah. like that. And I imagine you probably do this. Yeah. I imagine you know you draw this one all the time for people, and so it's quite alluring to look at this because it suggests first of all that people know where to draw these lines for their organisation. Do they? Yep. Um, not really. 
Um, again, it's looking at the value. Uh, a good example is Exchange. Um, yeah. if, you, if you look at Exchange, you go like, okay, it's email. How important is my email? But if you look at a business, if your email system is out for 15 minutes, you got your first users on the phone. After 30 minutes, they all go home. Um, they say, we cannot work because my, my exchange is, I, I cannot do emails. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the cost on that? It's not just the cost of the data, but it's also cost of productivity. And, and, and that's where it's finding that balance. And um, that line is, is a lot cheaper, uh, steeper than most people actually think. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, yeah, the, uh, Charles, I mean. I, I was going to ask here, the, oh. on the gray line, the one going up in the center, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. people can calculate those if they want to. But is your experience, which is more like my experience, people don't try and calculate the opportunity cost until something has happened. Yeah, then they find out the, the true cost of, <laughs> of the issue. Yeah, it's only when they've been bitten that yep. they start to actually even do it. And they're not methodical about it. Yeah, it they do it for the bit that was, was bitten, not necessarily for other parts of the business uh, uh, that weren't. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's closing the stable door after yeah. the horse has bolted at that point. Yeah. You know, you're making good after it's happened. Um, so, yeah. yeah. But it's, that's it's, and actually look look the the, uh, the dark lord's been he's watching us. Hi Tony, I see you. It's your your colleague Tony Locke is in, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nagging us about this to say uh, you know who in who in business actually wants to have responsibility for defining the value of the data because this is quite a difficult process that we have to yeah. go through and it reaches far beyond the IT department because this becomes an organisational and operational problem as well, to be able to decide where what the value of the data is in the business process, map that to your risk appetite, which very often is not mapped to the IT department's risk mitigation processes and everything like that. So we're getting into something, we very quickly get into something that's potentially yeah, quite problematic. Very much so. And we, you, know, you can look at your data sets in a business, you can cl classify them as being mission critical, business critical, and, you know, static data. Mm -hmm and then apply the right technology that's appropriate. So if you do have that business that's taking credit card transactions into a database, mm -hmm. if you lose the database, you can't replay that information. You don't hold the card numbers or the expiry dates. It's not, it's not your information. Mm -hmm. So if that is the core business, then that's the one that you should be looking at as you know, giving it the best protection with uh, minimizing the risk as much as you can. But here's the thing, I, see, I don't want to say you're dodging the issue here, but it's, it's a little bit, because that, yes, you can say, okay, credit card transactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's an example. I mean, that's an example. It's an example. But here's the, you know, the value of email is a very basic question, mm -hmm. but as Yap sort of points out, it's a very difficult question to answer effectively, isn't it? If you ask people, whilst it's still running, if you ask them what it is, people, you know, yeah. some people overestimate, some people underestimate the value of email as an application for their business. That's true. For example, if you're an online business um, and all your, all your transactions, all your orders come in through email, mm -hmm. um, just missing an hour worth of email, uh, not knowing if you received an order from customer XYZ, uh, could be very costly. And, and it's difficult. It could be a transaction for, for uh, $100 or £100, or it could be 10000 or £100,000. Mm -hmm. While if it's my emails, who cares? Um, they just resend if I don't respond, and they just resend after uh, after a day, and, and at that point I respond. Mm -hmm. So even for this, the same type of data, depending on what type of business you have, the, the value could be very different. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's the data usage in the business. How are you using the application, the data? Mm -hmm. That's the key thing: is to understand how that data is being used and what impact on the business it's having. And it's, it's an interesting thing, Charles, isn't it? But this graph doesn't really exist when everything's going right. It doesn't exist right. in people's heads. Right. Yeah, it only comes into, you know, actually a lot of people will suddenly realise where they are on this graph because a terrible thing happens. Exactly. And so being able to, so, being, so what I'm saying is being able to draw this, think about this and be able to draw this graph for yourself for a particular part of your business, a particular application, a particular yeah. process. It's a, it's a, it's a thought thing. process you need to go through to have a look at and understand the nature of the data in your business, understand what's important and what's not, not so important. But it's, it's not quite as simple as just looking at the data, yeah. because there are other things, and I remember a large telco company which made an error, but it took down its server for three days, its web server. Uh -huh. And so all, you know, as you were saying, like if your orders come through email, in this mm -hmm. case, everything, all the orders came through the web server, the web server went down, there was no business. Yes. Everything else was beautifully backed up, but not the web server. 
Uh, okay. Yes. So the, the business process is just <laughs> as important as the data. Yeah. How do we incentivize people? As Tony <laughs> says, how do we incentivize people to think about this sort of stuff? We incentivize you because you get to keep your job if you get it right. Well, those twelve monthly installments would, would, would come to an end. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now, let's see, okay. So let's have a look. So this is the you know this is the problem, and here are some of the practical problems of mm -hmm. working out what to do. Where well, you worked out what to do, let's have a look at exactly how you do it. So we have, two, we have two basic strategies for doing this, don't we? Agent-based uh, yeah, agent and agent-less. The age, yes? Yep, yep. I am correct. So agent-based data protection. Uh, yep, this is your bag, isn't it? It is, yep. You think this is a good idea? I think it's the best idea. How does it work? Um, so what you do is you put an agent inside every machine you're protecting. Mm -hmm. um, that could even be physical machines, but we're focusing on virtual environments. But you put a, uh, an agent uh, inside that machine. Uh, because of the agent inside there, we know exactly what's going on on the machine. We can protect exactly that data that needs to be protected. Uh, the agents make sure that whatever needs to be backed up is transferred to a backup server and the data gets stored in, uh, in, in some type of repository where we can keep it for an X amount of days or months, uh, depending on how long you want to keep the data. So every time you create a virtual machine, you put an agent inside that virtual machine. You can even make it part of the uh, the image because yeah. that's what people tend to do whenever they, uh, especially if you create more virtual machines, you've got a template, so you make sure the agent is there. But you still need to make sure the agent gets added to the backup. It's a very good point. To put it in the template for virtual machines. Mm. I don't know about you, but uh, not that many organizations have standard templates. So they would have the virtual, they have the agent included. It's, I agree with you entirely. It's a yeah. way to do it, but I don't see it happening often. No, that's true, and it, it could be part of, of rethinking your whole structure. And it goes back to that very complicated yeah. picture. Uh, you've got part which which came through organic growth, where you have to go in and and, um, and install the agent into all the different uh, machines. Uh, but we always like to, to help people and, and, and make them realize, okay, there there are some some capabilities even in VMware. Um, that can make your life easier. So you protect your virtual, or you create your new virtual machines based on a template, and you make sure that everything is in there. Not just your backup software, but your management software, your antivirus, whatever. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to go out and do it for every machine, because that is a recipe for disaster, because at that point, people will forget. Mm -hmm. well, the other advantage of doing it at that stage is organizations often don't like adding software to working systems. Agree. And so if you do it before they start working, it's a great deal easier. Yep. Uh, it's 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 creating a solution rather than giving yourself a problem. Yeah, essentially from from the from the I was getting getting ahead of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. So that's yeah. So uh, so yeah, you would say you're on the pro side for this. Yeah, I'm on the pro side, and like I said, one of the big benefits of having an agent inside of virtual machines is it's tight. It, it's tight uh, very nicely to the application. It knows what data. It knows which data is changing, and it can be very selective on the data it needs to pick out, and therefore it can do it very quickly. Hence the near CVP capabilities that we can achieve through the agents, mm -hmm. um, because it's an agent. Um, the way that the we've done it is, is there's a very simplified method of, of having the agents talk to the backup server. Uh, the, the authentication is within the agent, so once you put an agent on there, it knows where to backup the data um, once you add it to your backup uh, schedule. So uh, once you've added the agent, it, it's pretty straightforward to manage, um, and it gives you the near CDP capability. Okay. Uh, so uh, so uh, multi-site, what's this multi-site thing? So multi-site, uh, again, going back to that picture, um, there, there's more and more companies that have, let's say, remote sites, remote offices with yeah. a smaller IT environment, uh, maybe not even IT stuff. So what you want to do is put the agent there, make sure it, it, it creates a local backup because you want to do the restore always from a local machine. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the agent, uh, through um, some of the other capabilities, right, like replication, we can get the data across to our central site. Uh, where we then have a copy of the data. Where if we need to do a, re uh, a restore, we can do it either on the local side or we can do it um, in, in the headquarters. Well, this seems very intuitive to me. This seems quite simple. It's quite a straightforward way to do it. It is. Um, I would not say simple, but it, it is very straightforward. I say simple as in it's a simple thing to think. You know, yeah. you what you do. You know, you can conceptualize the idea of the you know the the sort of like the little man inside the virtual machine that's that's making sure that everything works the way it should do when it comes to this but we have some cons here what's the problem with this then Adrian? <laughs> time effort management it's okay maybe if you've got 
50, 60 machines, but of course we've all been discussing virtual machine sprawl, mm. how simple they are. To, so easy to create, simple to forget is what I say about virtual machines. Uh -huh, but you've got an agent, it doesn't matter. You've created. You've still got to add it into the backup server. You've still got to go and do that piece. Yeah. It's a manual process, right? Right. So, and you've got to know it exists. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right, yes. And then you've got to manage them all as well to make sure they're all running. Uh -huh. So you've got to look after those 50, 100, 150 increase ever increasing number of and so it's, it's not going to automatically pick machine. it up mm -hmm. I don't want you to in, interrupt my existing running machine yeah. put your wretched agent on there because who knows well, you, you, don't, do you, you don't have a choice Charles I'm going to do that because I but need to my, back up my, my environment of business and it's bringing in a hundred thousand uh, dollars a day or pounds or euros or whatever it may this be this is quite real it's quite real actually and that's yeah, why we yeah. need to protect it's it in the best because it brings in so much money I, I'm glad we're not running a business. We never get it started. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. So yeah, there isn't. So it, it's whilst it seems like you're doing everything with a, which a, is great. Yes, there are some caveats to it. Is yeah. I think what we're what we have to get across here is that there's going to be some extra management. There's going to be some extra time spent on it, and time's money. So mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's not automatic. You're it's not, not automatic. just solving the problem by putting the agent. Exactly. In. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see, and so therefore, as we say, there's the potential VM outages. Yeah, and the things you might miss, the virtual machines you could potentially miss, the data you might miss. Aha, uh -huh. I see. Well, that doesn't sound quite so encouraging. Yep, I was I was quite sold on your idea there for a minute, but now I've decided <laughs> that it's a bad idea. Is there anything? What would you about this? Is there anything that you say? These are good points that Adrian raises. Yeah. Um. No, let's wait until we go. Oh, OK. Oh, let's wait for later. You're a confident man. Oh, I am. And I, I, you know, I like that. So the other side of so the, the coin. So the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin. And let's move on. Agent Lus. Yes. Yeah, so this is the alternative technology that you can utilize in that virtual environment. Uh -huh. So this is where instead of talking to the virtual machines, you come up a layer and you start talking at the hypervisor, so the technology that the virtual machines sit on. Ooh. So now we, in this kind of technology, you hook into the hypervisor uh -huh. and you leverage its technology that it uses to look after the virtual machines. So this gives us the ability to snapshot the entire virtual machine very, very quickly and then move the data. So now I don't have to have agents inside the virtual machines. I don't have to manage each and individual virtual machines. Mm -hmm. I can have my solution that automatically finds new virtual machines, picks them up, and starts protecting them. Because the hypervisor Because the hypervisor knows over everything. The it's, it's over the whole thing. So it becomes a more pertinent uh, use of technology in that ever-increasing sprawl and that ever-increasing data set size you're going to get in your virtual infrastructure. I see. You sound quite confident about that. Fairly this. confident the, about this, that kind of technology. But this is a good idea, because let's have a look. So, 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 so pros. So pros are it's very cost effective because then, of course, you're not dealing with lots of virtual machines. Your management is less. You can spend less time on it. You can go and do the more sexy things in IT rather than looking at backups running. So it's going to be a lot more cost effective. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a simplified deployment methodology because then we don't have to worry about the templating issue. We don't have to worry about installing agents. We don't have to worry about downtime installing the agent in charges. Mm -hmm. Uber important. Uh, application he's got running in his virtual machine. That problem just goes away. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to worry about the content that's running at that time. We can just say, right, I'm going to set this all up. It's all done. I've set my schedules up. It's going to go and snapshot my virtual machines. It's going to move my data off. So it's reduced time, reduced effort, reduced management, reduced impact on Charles's application. It's all good. So it's, it's like one of those, sounds like one of those things that's good for people who prefer to think about this. Once when they have to, <laughs> yeah. and then not, right. not think yeah. about it again yes. until yeah. you come to call the next time to see how well, it's going. Maybe, yeah. and, and it has the benefit that you know if people are adding machines and so on, you just don't need to, to be concerned about that. Uh -huh. You don't need to become the sort of bad cop who says, yeah, "Don't forget to you know make your template and put your agent in right. there yeah. and everything like that." And, and we can be clever about the other technology that's in some of these hypervisors. You know, if you're moving virtual machines to another run on another host, we can track that, back that up. Mm -hmm. So without interruption. So you don't have to change anything. So even though you have technology moving the content around, 
attractive in an environment, I guess, when people are specifying, you know, setting up their own virtual machines and that sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. When, they, when, you, when you've given them the power to go away and do that, which is often what yeah. we talk about. When you've studio. lost that, that virtual infrastructure control to that level, mm -hmm. you know that everything's still protected. If they, do, if they produce it, we're going to find it. It's going to be backed up. It's, it's fine. Uh -huh. So it's, it's being able to sleep at night. Yeah. So <laughs> what's so bad about that then, yeah? Mr. Um, it's only doing the backups when he's actually sleeping. Um, I don't want to use an <laughs> agentless technology to, to run backups every five minutes um, because it's going to put a heavy load on your virtual environment. Uh, just imagine having 100 machines and trying to snap all those 100 machines five, every five minutes. Um, I think yeah. your VM environment is, is, is going gonna, is gonna to die slowly on you. So, um, so that, that will be one of the things. Uh, another thing is um, this works brilliantly in environments where everything is virtualized. So you've got a virtual machine with virtualized storage and everything. Um, now there's one user that really knows his stuff around VMware and says, OK, I want to get the best performance, so let's get some, uh, some uh, raw device mappings. So get some, some uh, storage that is actually not uh, virtualized. Yes. And suddenly you try to take a snapshot of a machine that has one volume that is not virtualized, and you're suddenly missing out data. Uh, and again, when you put the agent inside, we don't care if that volume is virtualized or, or not. We will always be the agent still the agent doing still it's, know, because it's, it's there. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you uh, want to be careful just trusting the software to do the work that you're getting paid. It sounds like you ought to be careful to be trusting right. Adrian, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <Tim>. It, sounds, <laughs> it sounds like you've oversold this. No, I, I, I mean, seriously, I mean, these are valid. Mm. Objections, because that's a kind of like a re these are sort of real world problems that will crop up. Well, all the potentially, time, yes, it? and a lot will depend on what you're doing in that infrastructure and how it's scaled and, and, and how it's configured and set up. So, yes, they're all valid points, certainly. Um, the other things that we can do at the hypervisor as well, don't forget, is that, well, instead of replicating backup data, we can also replicate live running VMs for DR to another virtual machine infrastructure. So, we can enable that kind of whole DR aspect be a lot cleaner and a lot smoother being able to fail over to a new set of virtual machines that are only you know maybe a few minutes old or a, you know a couple of hours old and so now you're copying the data twice once for a backup and once for a well potentially but you know we're talking about dr so what's what <laughs> you're mitigating your risk yep. yeah well, yes, if virtual machine replication, replication will replicate missing data as well as it will replicate corrupted data. So it, it forms part of the disaster recovery scenario. There are lots of elements you need to put together for that. So disaster recovery is one of those things, once you start thinking about it in detail... It's more and more and more. It's, once you get closer and closer and closer yeah. to it, it's like one of those fractal things that never mm -hmm. just gets any easier. Yeah. In fact, you, there, there are a lot of intricacies to this sort of thing. Very much so. That if... So I think what we're talking from both of these scenarios that you've painted, that if you just say, oh, I like that one, uh, then it's not going to, you, you're going to make a lot of sacrifices along the way because real life tends to intrude on these things. Yeah, I think you're beginning to realise where we might be going with this. So, yeah, yeah. so I think the audience is beginning to realise where we're going with this. I wonder perhaps, <laughs> this is where I set this up, I wonder perhaps... If we could have something that was maybe the best of both worlds. Oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Well, well. Now, it's, so, I, I, so what we're looking at, it, it, it is, you know, it's, we, we're making a sort of false dichotomy here, aren't we? It, you don't have to have one or the other. You don't have to sort of like say agent or agentless. Yeah, why, why sacrifice the technology when you don't need to? Um, you're looking at something that's applicable to the data in the business. That's kind of where we started with this. Yeah. So use the technology that's applicable for the data in the business. Okay. So don't forego one technology for the other just because. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't consider what's right for your infrastructure and your environment. So build this up in a, in a real life kind of way then. So um, we're looking at someone who has you know, a, a pretty sprawly virtual machine infrastructure and they're facing the normal problems that you see when you go and see customers. So, and, um, you know, you go over the pros and cons of both of these, and we say, let's use it together. So how do we then, then start to build that up into something realistic that they can build? Well, I think if you looked at their infrastructure, um, you look at the way their business is running and what they're using for the business. So a good example of the more static sites are the website aspect. Mm -hmm. It's fairly static with content pages that doesn't change that often. Maybe, maybe some sites that do change very often. But yeah. 
for in, in general business, you might think, well, my website's fairly static. I'll use an agentless technology for that because there's not a lot of change. It's important to have to be able to recover that website, as we, Charles mentioned earlier with his little uh, example there. If the website's down, people can't interact with the company. Yeah. But it's, it, it's not got that high change rate. And I think then if you look at the machines that do have the high change rate, we get the email stuff, the databases, that kind of content that's more relational. That's when you start to think, well, you know, it might not be so pertinent to use an agentless system here. Mm -hmm. I might need to actually put an agent inside that virtual machine and give myself a better level of protection for that kind of content. Mm -hmm. So the important thing then, Yep, as you're saying, is to be able to break down application by application. Or is it virtual? Is it, you, can't, you can't really do that. Virtual machine by virtual machine. Exactly what you're doing here. Um, not even virtual machine. I think you would even need to look at the, at the types of data. Mm -hmm. And you could even have one virtual machine having two completely different things. Um, yeah. Again, with virtual environment, we see that people tend to move to more specific machines doing one role. And at that point, you would go and you would single out those, those machines. It becomes easier to think yeah. about it then, yeah. that way, doesn't and you, it? And, and you take your business critical, your exchange service, your uh, SQL service that hold all your transactions, and you start protecting them very, uh, very frequently. Um, and then you take the other machines, like, like Adrian said, your web servers, and, and, and maybe uh, just once per day is enough. Mm -hmm. And it could even be a mix. It could be that you, uh, you're protecting a machine once per day, but you still need to be able to recover it uh, within 50 minutes. Right. Because yes. that web server, even though the data is static, uh, we still need to be able to bring it back as quickly as possible because we don't want to miss out all those transactions. Yeah. That, that's, that's another thing to look the at. The data it's might not be changing, but if you're not there, if then you're not there, it's not working. Yeah. Complete, so it sends yeah. out the so wrong it's message. it's not in that yeah. graph that if you move something, it, it's going to move on both sides. No, it, it, it could stay on, on, on the far, far left-hand side uh, for your, for your uh, recovery point, and, uh, but very close to your outage on the recovery time objective. Mm -hmm. So, Charles, how do we go about doing this, then? Do people sit in a room and well, make a list of... I was, well, that and that's one thing they should do for some. For some. Uh, yeah. But I actually, what I'm curious here is... Do you find that in uh, customers and clients that people start with an agentless and gradually move to agented because you, you get some progress immediately with agentless and then you actually start identifying what are your, the ones that should be agented, you know, like the transaction system and so point. on? Yeah, yeah so there, there is the, I need to go and protect it, I'll go and do that, done it's that. Done. Yeah. Okay, so now I can sit back and relax a little bit, thinking I've protected things. No, you and can't, then, yeah. Then you get into the, oh, hang on a minute, I need to actually think about that a little bit deeper. So mm -hmm. there's a level of comfort to start with, and then that comfort kind of declines a bit, and then they get into looking at thinking, well, actually, that's not important. I put in a minimum enough. standard, but it doesn't exactly. achieve my business Exactly, you've got your goals. minimum. Yeah. But now, actually, I've been asked to provide a service level agreement back to the business of maybe, you know, an hour or so. Well, I can't do that with my particular setup, so I now actually have to go and think about finding another piece of technology to enable that. Ah, do you find your find customers work that way, yeah? Yep. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, even though we talk about agentless uh, versus agent-based, um, most of them are still used to agents. Most traditional type of backup uh, solutions are still agent-based. So it's not that it's something new that we introduce. Actually, the agent-less part is more of the new part. The agent-based is, is, is more of what they're used to anyway. Ah, that's, oh, now here's a, here's a question from Graham. This, this, yeah. He said, installing agents on a template may not be an option as many backup solutions have different agents required depending on the type of server. Is that? That could be true for some solutions, uh, not for the one that we have on offer. Aha! It depends, it depends, <laughs> on, the, it depends <laughs> on the solution. So, uh, yeah, so you keep watching for another five minutes, Graham. You might find out something that would, uh, that would help uh, on that. Okay. So, you know, so the, on our best of uh, on our best of both worlds, the, the the outcome that you get from this is it does mean that you can sort of trade off. You know the problems that each of you pointed out on the single the single idea. You can get rid of those, but still, where you need the benefits, you can still have those. Yeah. So for, for each way of doing it, the pros for each way cancel out the cons for each other. So yes. you end up with all all pros at the end of the day. Mm. Um, by combining the technologies to give you what you need in your environment. You are the yin and the yang of data protection. <laughs> <laughs> that cancel each other out. Yes. 
Well, yes. Well, yes. <laughs> but it's, but also, I mean, the cost of that, basically, is you have to keep two ideas in your mind about what you're doing. You have to think about two technologies and, and the applicable uh, technology for the data sets you've got running mm -hmm. in your business, certainly, yeah. And you have to be able to evaluate the, uh, you have to be able to uh, evaluate the outcomes in some different scenarios and to yeah. be able to say, I have the point, go back to our graph, Mm -hmm. and be able to say, I have... This is where I am. This is where I actually am on this, and this is where, you know, this is the cost of increasing network yeah. traffic for me. This is the cost of not having this. Event. Exactly, yeah. The cost of the impact on solutions, depending on which one you want to employ, and mm. the cost of what that has in the infrastructure as well. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find yourself helping people do those sums, or really is it their job to do them for themselves? Um, it, it depends on, on who you talk to. Um, usually just enlightening them to the point of going looking at your data sets yeah. is enough for them to go, oh, oh okay, let's look at it from that, that approach. And, and usually that's enough to trigger them. They understand their infrastructure mm. better than, than anybody else. So they'll understand what's what people will shout at them down the phone at when it's not there. <laughs> that's a cost. That, that's a cost you know, that's not really captured in it's, uh, Exactly, in that's, that's the it's one. The, one yeah. the stress and the pain are when things don't work. They'll yeah, know which one. But it is a real are. one. I mean, that's yeah, it's, it's, people are shouting for a good reason. They're yeah. not shouting just because well, they like yeah, to shout. Most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. We, they, you know, we assume they are. So actually what we talked about, we don't have to calculate the cost get down to the nearest dollar or euro or pound you have to have a good grasp of, of what you want to do or what you need to do and perhaps what your basic level of service has to be yeah. and built, yeah. Uh, uh, there is another advantage. You actually introduce, by combining both, you introduce flexibility. So something that is, needs an agent today uh -huh. may not need an agent after yeah. the Christmas season mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And equally, something that is agentless but acquires a new importance or is a new capability introduced, you now know, well, now it's time to put in an agent because it matters to us more. Mm -hmm. Now, to be to, to, uh, now, Mr. Agentless Adrian, Dan is asking, is it possible to have granular file level restores on agentless backup? Yes, you can do that. Yes, do that. certainly the technology is available to That's do that. Right. Um, we also index content as well, so you can search for it too. So speeding that time to recovery for just the one file you need you don't want to be trawling through lots of backups and manually searching for it. You want yeah. to be able to do a little wildcard search. There's the one I need. A few clicks, put it back, done. You've been very good guests. So let's talk about you. And let's talk about how you do this in products. Because we've already had a couple of things, questions that come up where it's yeah, very basically like, <laughs> well, the way <laughs> we do it is the way it works for us is. So let's have a look at the way uh, it, it does work. Dell, Apashore, Yap. What's Apashore? So Apashore is a backup and recovery solution, which is agent-based, um, agent that can help you to edge. protect your environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it can take uh, what we call backups as frequent as every five minutes. So your recovery point objective will shrink to that five minutes. And uh, as we said before, you don't want to do that for all your machines. You want to save that for the most critical machines. And then with the technology built in, um, it's not just out on taking the data. We want to make sure we got a copy of the data because um, if disaster strikes, it's always going to be a big disaster. So you want to, don't want to have everything in one place. You might want to have a copy of your data somewhere else. As Adrian was mentioning, we might even want to spin, be able to spin up uh, another copy of, of, uh, of your virtual machine somewhere else. Um, and again, it's it's also it's not just the uh, the backup. Backup is only the smaller part. I always say it's it's more about the recovery, mm. because you can backup whatever you want if if that data cannot be recovered um, in a timely uh, in a timely manner. And I think that's important. Uh, that is where things are going to count. Um, and uh, with Epicure, we've got technology that can actually make the data available, regardless if that is a, a file server with 15 million files or an exchange server with two terabytes of mail stores. We can actually make that data available to the end user within a couple of minutes. Uh -huh. And the only way we can do that is through the use uh, of the agents and the technology that's building into these agents. Okay, so it's the it's the you know the fast the store. Take, Back up frequently, and a fast restore is really the thing. If you're looking for that, yeah. this is the thing that you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the benefits it. the agent has, so the agent is monitoring all the, the activities on the disk. So when we do a backup, we will, we will make sure we only backup the changed data. 
because it's not going to make any sense if you want to back up every five minutes to copy all your data because at 90 you'll be just yeah, you won't be able to do anyway. anything because yeah. you're too busy backing up so the, the agent done. is going to yeah. monitor all the disk activities and it's going to say okay only in in those five minutes or in those 15 minutes only these blocks have changed and the only thing the agent does is it moves the data from a to b it moves it to the backup server the backup server is going to do all the heavy lifting it's going to do the encryption it's going to do compression it's going to do deduplication which is very important yeah. i would say for every solution that's all built in um, and then, like I said, for the recovery, uh, that agent gives us the ability to present the data back to the user, um, uh, either through the agent within a couple of minutes, where if you start a restore, uh, the first thing we do is re we restore the file structure. So from an end user perspective, from an application perspective, it looks like all the data is there. And then while in the background, we're copying the data. But if there's a request for some data that has not been restored yet, the agent is smart enough to pick that request up then prioritize the, uh, the request for the data, get it back to the server, and then give it back to the end user. Mm -hmm. So there is some performance degradation, um, but it's either um, basically not having your exchange server up for the next two hours and wait until after two hours it's completed and then have access to, a, uh, to all your emails at full speed, or basically wait two minutes and then have all your emails, emails available, and it might perform at 80% of normal uh, capacity, but at least everything is there. And it's the same, and that was a good example, that, uh, that restore of a file server, 15 million files. I think everyone that has ever been involved in, in restoring data and knows um, how painfully slow fifth, uh, the, the restore of 15 million files is going to be. Um, and like I said, Murphy's Law was going to say that the file you need the most is always going to be the last one that's going to be restored. So you don't want to be waiting there for two days. And I literally, you could be waiting for two days there. I like it when you're describing these things, this sad nodding from my... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you said we've all been there. Uh, yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then one yeah. thing I want to highlight, um, not taking away too much uh, from Adrian, but one thing uh, that we can also do is we've got the agent that copies all the data from the uh, machine we're protecting. So we only move the data once. Once it's in the backup server, we can either present it for recovery, but we can also build a copy of that machine as a, what we call virtual standby. Mm -hmm. And that could either be on the same side or could be on, on the replica side. So now you only have to move the data once. Uh, if that server fails for whatever reason, we basically have a copy already waiting uh, just to be powered on. Uh, and you can continue your production on that machine. And it's an exact copy. So you can actually run production on it. It will be protected while you run, while you rebuild your, your original machine. Yeah, nothing along with this, Charles. You, this, this, I mean, it, 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 it seems to have, uh, it, it seems to be quite a practical way of doing, sort of like, like you said, the eighty percent that you need. It's, quickly. A, it's a nice way of doing it. It's a yeah. sensible way because the, you I mean, you can't make everything instantaneously reavailable just by snapping your fingers. Mm. Um, nobody's going to mind some degradation for a while if it brings you back to working again properly. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now the B Ranger, that's more on your side of the business. Yeah. So this is this is Very the easy. this is the agentless solution. So yes. V Ranger uh, is all about scale and speed. Yeah, it's a very, very fast backup application. It backs up multiple virtual machines in parallel. We can recover multiple virtual machines in parallel. So when you have a major outage, it's really going to speed your recovery because you're not looking at putting back individual machines one after the other. You can just push them all back, get yourself up and running very, very quickly. So you have that high speed um, technology inside there. We can replicate virtual machines as well. So live running virtual machines can be replicated to another virtual infrastructure somewhere else, which means that you've got failover and fail back capability for DR. You can spin up your virtual machines very quickly, your DR site, and away you go. So it's an enabler of a larger infrastructure. So we're talking hundreds of virtual machines now to, to back up, replicate, so recover. select from within which the, a grouping of virtual machines? Yes, you can actually have um, grouped backups as well if you want to. You can create a, a backup schedule around a group of virtual machines and have different schedules and timings based on groups. Then anything put into the group gets automatically picked up, backed up. So you, you're going to cover those virtual machines that just appear. So. We have that high performance scalability piece inside there. We have some patented technology inside there to reduce the amount of data that you back up as well. So when we get into agentless based backup, we do full image backups and then we get into incremental imaging. Now that technology, for example, in VMware is provided by, us by something called change block tracking, which just tells us the blocks inside the virtual machines that have changed since the last backup. Now we have some 
uh, technology in there called active block mapping that looks at those blocks and de decides, well, these blocks have been marked for deletion. I don't need to back those up. And a page file that's inside a Windows machine, well, I don't need to back that up either. So I'll just discard those. So we can reduce an incremental image backup by like 30%. So ah. now you're getting to moving just the unique blocks of data. So you're actually moving less and you're storing less, you're reading less. There's two, two questions come in basically on this. Is the, is the, is because they're saying the real pain of this is all the extra storage that you have to yeah, Exactly, and this is where we can start reducing the content. <coughs> so it works when you were scanning the virtual machine, we're reading the content, and also when we actually write the content out. So we're actually moving less data. Uh -huh. What sort of overheads are we talking about still? That, that active block mapping overhead, fairly minimal actually. Mm. It's, it's pretty much a, an impactless technology. We don't actually have any real major impact on that. We've been quite clever about how we deliver that technology. I'm going to ask you another real, uh, piece of string question. It's <laughs> 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 my ball of string out again. Uh, yeah, exactly. You, you dodged the last one. The, um, for the, the, the sort of overhead that we're talking about in storage, like the, you know, when, if people are talking really vaguely, effective disaster recovery and how much, mm -hmm. uh, how, how much extra storage are they going to have to have for that? Um, storing it, the storage that you're going to use for protecting virtual machines in this way is going to be dependent on how long you want to keep the data for, so the retention period uh -huh. and the size of data. Those are the two things that drive the storage. So we get into other technologies to solve that problem. You see, we create problems for ourselves <laughs> and then we, look for, then we look for solutions, right? So we get into technologies like deduplication. Yeah. Um, that effectively looks at the content of the images, spots, the, spots the, the similarities, keeps one content and throws the other away and puts pointers in. So it starts reducing that technology. Mm -hmm. And as Dell, we have some great technology for deduplication. <laughs> so so one, th one thing I want to add yeah. here, and, and that's what I see with a lot of customers, we're talking about disaster recovery solutions here. Yep. So theoretically, what, you, what you're looking for is you, you're copying your data, and you want, if, if there's a disaster, you want to recover it to a point in time. Mm -hmm. That point in time, you never. I don't think you're ever going to recover to a point in time that was four months old. No. Because you're not going to take your production machine, move it back four months, and say, okay, this is what I want to work with. So you want to be careful to, I always say, start abusing your disaster recovery solution for things like archiving and long-term storage. If that is your goal, you probably want to, to, to look at... Um, at Go at to another department well. down yeah. the corridor from you, which is basically dealing with that sort of thing. Don't start... Yeah. Yeah, that, and, and, that's not and disaster sure, recovery sprawl. No, as well, and surely yeah. we can do it. Yeah. You, you, and, and I'm pretty sure that most companies do it. If you look at the tape based solutions, yeah. there, there's, there's plenty of, of companies out there that keep their yearly backup tapes and keep them for seven years. Where the first question is, okay, will I ever be able to read that tape after seven years? The second thing is, it will hold data for, let's say, an Exchange 2000 environment, which if I need it, um, it's going to take me forever because I need to build an now exchange server. Now you're getting into the interesting issue of how many times do you keep a given piece of data? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. And, you know, it, uh, some calculations we have done, yeah. it can be up to 250 times. Really? I mean, and what, what do you need? Eight? Ten, perhaps, maximum? Yeah. But you can go to 250 without trying. Uh, that's extreme. Yes, that's well, extreme. But, you're, but all point. of those have a cost yeah. because, you know, even if it's just the cost of making that back up, <laughs> And having it kicking around, taking up yeah, space. Absolutely. Quite and, apart from and of course, that will also sometimes be driven by regulatory requirements as well. So there are certain businesses that are regulated and, and told to keep data for, yes. for many years. So in which case, you, you just do give that. it to the NSF and they'll do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you say NSA or is it the NSA? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> the, uh, so the, the, the final thing, just because we're, we're more or less out of time, there's a thing we haven't discussed there called NetVault. Uh, yeah, so NetVault is, is kind of like the, the, the last piece in the puzzle that we have as a solution portfolio. So if you look at that, that picture there, it's kind of like a stopwatch which you can run around looking at the kind of recovery RT and RPO yeah. kind of objectives. NetVault is a broad, heterogeneous backup and recovery solution that does both agent and agentless, but not to the same extent as Aperture and VRanger. So let's be clear about there's a need for everything here. Yeah, you're, you're ap so your Aperture and your VRanger, if you have very precise requirements on those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you want something that's going to do some stuff for you, then NetVault. The NetVault's going to cover... A bit of everything. A bit of everything across your entire infrastructure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, guys. We're uh, out of time.
We haven't got any more time to discuss this. I just got further reading links. Are rather uh, not very specific today, are they? Look at that. We've just got <laughs> so it's going to it's hugely it, descriptive, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. it's going to be. But you can get uh, you you can download these uh, and have a go with them. Yeah, all, all the products are available for download from the website. Um, they all run fully functional for a period of time, so you can download, you can play, you can install, you can do what you like with them. You, you can start protecting your environment. Yeah, from day one. Yes, until, yeah, until, <laughs> until the bill arrives. Until the, yeah, until the free <laughs> bit runs out, which gets you back to square one. But, guys, thank you very much. That's, that's actually very clear. I, I, you know, I feel that I know more. I couldn't, know, I couldn't have known less, to be honest, coming in this, but I do feel that I know more, genuine, uh, genuinely speaking. John, thank you very much. Has it been? You're coming back again. Well, if you'll invite me, of course. Well, of course, we'll invite you. Are you going to get Adrian and tell the story about the people? Oh, the, the, the disaster back? recovery. So that. There was a company I spoke to uh, um, about, uh, I suppose, a year, 18 months yeah. ago about disaster recovery. We were having a conversation, and I asked them what their disaster recovery plan was. And they said, you know what? It's so expensive for us. Our DR plan is to go out of business. That's not a plan, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the response. Was, OK, well, I'll just pack my bag up, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> What's your plan if you get sick? Well, <laughs> my plan is to drop dead. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, you know, so... This is, yeah, this is not a plan. I it's assume, not a plan. I assume that most of the people you deal with are not like that. They're not, no. I'd say 99.9% .9 <laughs> are the reverse of that. Yeah, you know, you've got to hope so. And I assume the people that have been along watching this today, you are also not like that, or else, you know, why would you come along and, and find out about this? I hope that's been useful. Let us know. If you've got any more questions, also send those in. Uh, let us know how the Regcast was for you. Uh, friend of guys, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Tim. And um, please join us for our next Regcast. I've been Tim Phillips. From me, goodbye. <laughs>